Sure. Yeah. Yes. And Petra, so maybe we can you can start at um, so I take over from here. Yes. Okay. okay. I will admit um, all people in now. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this civic uh, seminar. We will wait a few minutes for everybody to join before we start. We will start in a minute or two. So let's get started. Welcome everybody to this uh, Civica Data Science Seminar Series. I am Petra Kranovac, professor at Central European University, and I will be your host today. Uh, and our guest speaker today is Professor Giacomo Calzonari. You can see him on the blue background over there. Uh, he is a professor at the European University Institute, which he joined in 2018. He is an economist and he has published in top international journals such as American Economic Review, and Journal of Economics, International Economic Review, uh, Games and Economic Behavior. Um, he has received several awards during his career, uh, such as the Young Economist Award of the European Economic Association and the 2014 Best Paper Award by the Association of Competition Economics. He is an active member of many organizations, uh, among which the steering committee of the European Association of Industrial Economics, the Association of Competition Economics and the Economic Advisory Group on Competition Policy of the European Commission. His work is varied and includes uh, competition policy, economics in regulation, industrial organization, banking regulation and supervision, and the economics of incentives. Today, he will be talking about artificial intelligence and algorithmic recommendation and competition. I believe this topic is super interesting in the current uh, days where artificial intelligence is becoming more prominent and many people are not aware that online everything became a recommender and not being just a search engine. And I hope that Giacomo will address this uh, uh, thoroughly today. Uh, so I will see that everybody is muted, which is very nice. Uh, keep uh, your, um, we will have a question and answering session at the end. 
so we got your questions ready. And if you put anything in the chat, I will be able to read it. And uh, OK, uh, Giacomo, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Petra. Thank you. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here today uh, discussing with you about my research. Uh, I just wanted to add that uh, I'm, um, I'm among the many kind words uh, that Petra mentioned on, on my career, about my career, I would like to mention that I'm uh, directly involved uh, as Dean of Research in the, the organization of Civica. And uh, I think it's, uh, uh, so what, what this alliance is doing is really uh, extremely interesting uh, and uh, I would say also a novelty uh, in the panorama of uh, uh, European uh, uh, collaboration between uh, uh, European universities. So let's go um, to uh, this paper. Uh, it's a joint work with a group of uh, colleagues and friends, uh, Emilio Calvano, Vincenzo Nicolò and Sergio Fassarello, with whom I've been working on uh, artificial intelligence since uh, uh, some years now. Uh, we have some papers on the uh, impact of uh, algorithmic pricing, for example, on markets. Uh, if you're interested, uh, I can send you uh, some more details. And the talk of today will be about uh, uh, the uh, one particular application of artificial intelligence in market, which is uh, algorithmic uh, recommendation. Um, so uh, let me walk you through if I'm able to do so. With, okay, here we go. Um, so as also Petra mentioned, uh, uh, we are aware that in digital markets, we are essentially swimming in a notion of uh, uh, products, items, objects that we can buy, try, uh, listen, watch, think about uh, the many uh, items you can buy on uh, Amazon marketplace. We are talking about uh, several hundred millions of different items, or the news you could uh, um, listen, watch, and read uh, uh, in the different outlets, or the movies you can um, uh, watch on uh, Netflix, which currently has a catalog of, uh, uh, in, in, U in the US, uh, uh, 6,000 uh, different movies, and, and a catalog that keeps uh, uh, constantly changing. On Spotify, you can listen about uh, currently 90 million of different songs, um, but also um, the 26 billion of uh, videos that you can watch on, on YouTube. Um, so literally, we have so many options that is uh, uh, difficult to, uh, very difficult to navigate as user of all these possible items. So the tool, one of the tools that we can use nowadays, or if you, uh, continue with the uh, metaphor, uh, the sextant that we can use to navigate this ocean of products is uh, uh, the recommender systems. The recommender systems are software programs. You see here a, a tentative definition. Software programs that are providing personalized suggestions or recommendations to users, that is consumers, about uh, specific items and products. Essentially, what the recommender system does is to predict preferences um, and provide personalized recommendation to individual users. And they do so, of course, I'll give you more details on that. They do so by collecting information on users' valuation of items that uh, others, other users, have tried in the past. So that's why computer scientists mentioned is, uh, these tools as collaborative tools. Um, so this is uh, just to give you a vivid example of a uh, recommender system. When you enter the Amazon web page, you are prompted with the potential uh, items, the items that you can potentially be interested in. Uh, for example, the, uh, a set of books or a set of products. And similarly, if you log into Spotify, you are prompted with uh, um, uh, what they call a weekly discovery or daily discovery, which is a set of songs that may be interesting uh, to you. So this is uh, just two applications, but there are many others, as was mentioned before, not only products and music, but also mu uh, movies, uh, videos on YouTube, the, the socials. Uh, when you choose a, an application, then uh, you are typically prompted uh, uh, applications that you can upload on your phone. But also there are more uh, um, 
probably less common applications like uh, financial products. Uh, when you buy a financial asset, you may be using what is now called the Robo Advisor, which is a recommendation system that tells you according to uh, your characteristics and the assets characteristic, what could be a good match between you and a different asset. And, and also nowadays uh, as academics, we are prompted even articles to read. For example, uh, Elsevier, the publisher has a, a quite effective uh, recommended systems. And if you are an editor of an international journal, again, Elsevier is offering you a tool that helps you to identify and to identify reviewers for papers that you have to handle uh, as, a, as an editor of a journal. So that's just to say that the recommender, syst recommender systems are ubiquitous. They are overall and they are already affecting our lives. So why do we care about all this? Well, as I said, they are affecting our lives. Uh, if there are some already some uh, quite interesting data that show that, uh, for example, 75% of the movies that are watched on Netflix have been recommended by Netflix to Netflix users. 35% of items that are bought uh, on Amazon are uh, uh, recommended. 40% of the songs that people listen in Spotify have been recommended to listeners and 60% of videos that are watched on YouTube are, have been recommended by uh, YouTube. And on top of this sub just observation that is they are already affecting individual choices, there are worries that uh, um, algorithmic recommendations may somehow negatively impact our lives. Okay, so there is a not uh, and heated policy debate about the risk in terms of competition and even democracy uh, on both sides of the oceans in Europe and in the US. Just to just to mention two uh, group of countries uh, uh, that are um, really debating our recommended systems. In Europe, you can uh, find this uh, sentence on the uh, recently approved directive uh, Digital Service Act on digital market that says specifically large online platform may need to mitigate the negative effects of personalized recommendations. So you see in this rule that is even an explicit indication of negative implications of a recommended system in our, uh, in our lives. There are issues in uh, what is called uh, uh, richer, uh, rich get richer effect. That is, a recommended system may increase the popularity of uh, items, songs, or movies, or whatever uh, object we are uh, talking about. And another interesting uh, potential issue with a recommended system is what computer scientists call the feedback loop issue which is a, an interesting and endemic fact of uh, artificial intelligence applications in market. That is, we know that AI tools need to be trained, but once you deploy an AI tool in a market, like a recommender system, the, uh, the tool will affect the choices and the data that the tool will then use to be trained and retrained over time. Okay, so, uh, so the AI tools generate this feedback loop, they affect market outcomes and market data, and then they are retrained on the market data, the very same market data they contributed to generate, okay? Possibly generating what uh, uh, is called a feedback loop or endogeneity issue. Now, so punchline, the recommender systems are ubiquitous, they are affecting our lives. There are worries about these tools, these artificial intelligence tools. Well, we decided to look into it. And of course, we were not the first to do, but in a sense, we uh, took um, a relatively novel approach, which is through the lenses of uh, a typical economist. Okay, so let me mention what I mean with that with some more specific details. So, um, recommender systems, when you apply this tool in a market, uh, certainly affect at least three group of people. The buyers or the users of items uh, online. So uh, they mediate users' bias decisions, generating what we can dub, and I'll come back with more details later on, an algorithmic demand or a demand that is mediated by uh, the algorithm. For example, they give uh, prominence to certain products and items. When you enter the Amazon web page, you are prompted a certain list of items. 
Okay? And this prominence has consequences and implication on uh, uh, individual decisions. In the ocean of items uh, that we can, uh, that we live in, they are also informing about unknown products. Okay? Uh, then also sellers are affected by the presence of algorithmic uh, recommendations. Once you, once sellers realize that consumers' decisions are mediated by algorithmic, um, by these algorithms, they will adapt. They will change their strategies. For example, they will adapt their pricing strategies. Okay, and also of course platforms that adopt these recommendation tools are affected by recommended system, and they have some important choice to make not only with respect to the specific algorithm they can use, but also with respect uh, to the quality of the recommendation, whether they want to provide the best recommendation for their consumers or whether they want to engage into what is called manipulation of recommendation. Okay, So what you see in blue here is the three group of people and the three elements I'm going to discuss uh, uh, in, in my talk. Okay, so how uh, recommended system affect prominence of buy uh, for buyers uh, with respect to certain products. The uh, uh, fact that sellers will adapt to the presence of recommended systems and the fact that platforms are employing and pos possibly designing these, these tools. So the kind of questions we address in this, uh, in this analysis is what you see here. So we know, as we said, that recommended systems are sh already shaping users, consumers' uh, choices. So, so they are affecting uh, market outcomes. And so we want to know, for example, to what extent the recommended system can be just seen as a search cost reduction, as it was at the very beginning, for example, internet for e-commerce, or whether there is something more. Second, whether uh, recommendations are biased. Uh, whether they are biased because they are deliberately so by choice of the platforms they are using or not, what are the implications of these potential biases? We want to know whether dominance of sellers or certain sellers or certain products can be further reinforced by the presence of a recommended system, and uh, ultimately we want to know what is the impact on product market competition and user welfare. Okay, you see, it's a very broad agenda. In fact, I, would, I should have said that this is not just a single paper, it's a, it's a, it's a large project that hopefully will, will induce, will generate several um, academic outputs. Now, how an economist would can address uh, this, all these type of um, uh, questions? Well, the idea is that we would like to use actual algorithms uh, and try to see what are the implications of actual algorithms. Algorithms that are realistically can be uh, very close, if not similar, uh, to those that are actually used in those uh, in examples that I mentioned before. So if you want, so of course this is quite challenging uh, uh, endeavor, and there are possibly different methods. One method is to try and study all this from a purely theoretical point of view. The problem is that AI tools are very complicated tools, and it's uh, becoming this theoretical approach becomes uh, quickly uh, intractable. A second possibility is to use uh, data that comes from uh, actual and real market. And here we have a data scarcity issue. There are some data sets on which we can work, but uh, they come with a significant uh, limitation. So the approach that we take uh, here is an experimental approach. So we're going to simulate an economic market, a market with all these uh, uh, its players, uh, buyers and sellers, and we're going to uh, use an algorithm in the class of the recommendation system that is uh, uh, realistically close to uh, what uh, actual applications are, and then through simulations, we will study the implications of the presence of the recommended system into this uh, simulated uh, market. Okay, so that's the approach uh, we're gonna use in the in this um, uh, environment for this environment. Okay, so let me start with a conceptual framework. Okay, so here there is a little bit of um, uh, uh, economic tools. So uh, we're going to start with some basic ingredients. So a set of items, uh, uh, which is indicated here with capital J, a set of users or consumer, uh, capital I, and, and a data set, which is uh, what is called a rating matrix, capital R. Uh, 
This rating matrix contains ratings for some items that were effectively tried and consumed in the past uh, by some users. Okay? So if you think about real-world rating matrix, these are very, typically very sparse metrics. For example, it's, uh, the, the idea is in the ballpark of just one to 5% of non-empty cells in this rating matrix. So think about, for example, a rating matrix of net, Netflix. You would have, let's say on, on the rows, the different uh, users uh, of Netflix. On the columns, you would have the different items, that is the different movies that you can watch on Netflix. And each uh, non-empty cell contains the rating that in one way or another, that particular user expressed on that particular movie that that user uh, had the opportunity to, to see and watch. Okay? So you, you can apply this framework of given a set of items, given a set of users, and the rating matrix to any of the environment I was mentioning before. So the goal of a recommender system in this environment is then to match items and users. And in particular, the recommender system will predict preferences using, uh, sorry, predict preferences and ratings for unobserved user item combinations. That is all the blank cells that you would have in the rating matrix. Then once you predict those preferences, you for each one of the users, you rank these um, uh, ratings, and then you provide to each one of the users a personalized recommendation showing him or her the best ranked, the high, highest rank uh, items. Okay, so that's logically the idea. So, um, uh, from the economic point of view, the economic model I'm going to present uh, and we use in our analysis is uh, it's a standard model, so I'll quickly go through it. We consider a standard discrete choice model where each one of the users facing this uh, set of items will have to choose which item to consume, which item to, uh, uh, um, to choose and consume. So, and we're going to consider differentiated or substitute products that contain systematic correlation across users and across items. And the systematic correlation is uh, important, of course, because only in that, in that environment, the recommended system may be possibly useful. Okay, and, and we create a population of uh, users and a set of items that are rep respectively represented for the set of uh, items. Uh, by a vector of characteristics. So beta j is this vector that explains for product j each one of the characteristics of the products, for example, the color, uh, the size, uh, the content of sugar, whatever. So you can name all the possible characteristics and you identify any given item, a given product with this set of characteristics. On the other side, you have user preferences, okay, where you can express how much a user I likes any uh, um, of uh, each one of these preferences, so, uh, the content of sugar in a candy bar or the color of an object, and et cetera. Okay, then you, we uh, build a set of preferences so that the utility of user I for item J is just the product vector of item and user characteristics plus some uh, IID uh, shock. The interesting part of this here is that we can, we are creating an economy by just simply picking up uh, the theta, the vectors of theta and the vectors of beta, describing respectively uh, preferences and uh, product characteristics. As I mentioned before, we're going to allow for uh, differentiation, both uh, what we economists call horizontal differentiation and vertical differentiation. So I'll be quick here. The idea is that on horizontal differentiation, there are dimensions, these are dimensions where uh, we have uh, our own opinions, so I may like more uh, uh, sugary candy bar and you might, might like uh, 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 less sugar in it. But on, our, on the vertical dimension, instead, we all agree that uh, higher quality products are better, but some will be able to afford, some others will not be able to afford because they typically come at a higher cost and higher price. Okay, so we, we have a, a broad range of description of, of, the pro of the products. Now, the difficulty for our consumers in our economy is that they know that this product exists, 
okay? but they don't know the product characteristics. So they are incomplete informed on uh, this vector of uh, betas. Okay? So there are then two options. Either they try products period after period, uh, or what we can, uh, what, this is what we call a random search uh, pro, uh, possibility. Or, and this of course is costly, it requires uh, some search, some, uh, some uh, waiting time and uh, some attempts. Or you can rely on the recommendations, okay? And of course you can even decide that you don't like the recommendation and you can start your search process on top of that. So that's more or less the economic environment. With respect to the algorithms that we are gonna use um, when, uh, for, for the platforms for the recommendations, well, I will be quick again on this. Uh, computer scientists are providing a wide range of, or a large family of recommended systems. Uh, we will focus on what is called model-based collaborative filtering. Uh, these are uh, uh, recommendation systems that are designed to deal with um, very large rating matrices that are uh, uh, realistically large or large like those you could find, for example, in Amazon, where we have millions of users and millions of, of, of uh, items. Okay, so uh, this is our choice on the recommender system. Uh, I will skip the details of the model base and then let me just walk you through on a, a last uh, set of information on what we have done, then I will go uh, into the results. Okay, so we, we as I said, we built the economy. Now, we build also a, a, a data set, the rating matrix, replicating, uh, to the best of our knowledge, what is uh, a very good information about a, a realistic rating matrix, rating, sorry, rating matrix, and we will refer to the Netflix challenge here, where Netflix uh, made available one particular rating matrix that is somehow meant to be representative of their own rating matrix. So we match the characteristics of uh, this rating matrix. <clears throat> and, um, and then we run simulations of recommendations in our economy uh, for a certain number of times. And I'm gonna show you the averages uh, of this simulation. So what is important, uh, so there, there are two points I want to mention at this stage here. One is that we're going to compare, in the results I'm going to show you, we're going to compare uh, two environments. In order to understand what is the implication of having a recommended system in a market, we're going to compare an environment where there is no recommendations. As, as I said before, users are on their own and they have to search for the best product available in, in these unknown markets. Um, and the uh, alternative environment is where we uh, open up the door to a recommended system that first give a recommendation, uh, gives a recommendation to users, uh, personalized, and then users decide whether to follow the recommendation or to disregard it and continue this uh, autonomous search I was mentioning in the previous case. Okay, so we're going to compare these two cases. The other element I want to mention here is that we study two types of data. One data which is uh, where the rating matrix. Uh, completely exogenously generated so that uh, the ratings that are contained in the rating matrix are just randomly uh, picked up before we start our analysis, of course, on the basis of uh, uh, the economy we generated. And the alternative is there is instead where we have endogenous data, where the rating matrix is generated by uh, a repeated interaction of the recommended system with the market. Okay, so by comparing these two cases, we're gonna show, I'm gonna show you what is the implication of what I was mentioning before is the feedback loop of um, artificial intelligence tools applied to market. Okay, so in the first part of set of results I'm gonna show you, uh, uh, we just assume that sellers of these items are completely passive. So they, they have nothing to choose. Uh, in particular, they don't change their prices, okay? And this will be affected instead uh, in the second part because we're gonna allow them to react to the presence of a recommender system. And also in the first part of the presentation, platforms will re always recommend the best match. So the algorithm will calculate what is the best match uh, for each one of the users and will make that recommendation. So there will be, for the first part, no manipulation. 
Okay? And now we'll introduce manipulation later on. So let's go to, uh, to the results. Uh, so what you see here is a, is a first set of results indicating the market share of uh, a set of items. Okay? So and in particular, what we have done, we ordered it, uh, the market share of um, uh, a given set of items that consumers have uh, decided to consume. So on the left, under the benchmark label, you see what would be the market share in this large market attributed to the best, the second best in terms of market share uh, of the different products. So you essentially see relatively similar market shares. Okay, that's the individual search benchmark where individually uh, each one of us, without the help of a recommender system, search for the items, for the products in this portion of different uh, items. Okay. In the middle, you see, in the uh, uh, green histogram, uh, you see the market shares that is generated once we introduce the recommender system with exogenous data. Okay. And you notice immediately that the market share of the product that has the largest market share is way larger than the market share that that product would have had uh, in the case of individual search, okay? And uh, so essentially what we can see from here is that the recommended system creates superstar products in an environment where they're without the recommended system, uh, there are none essentially. And also if you look at the impact of endogenous data, you see somehow a slightly even uh, uh, more relevant uh, push towards uh, superstar products, but it's a second order effect. So it's a small feedback loop uh, effect. So overall, what we document is uh, a significant uh, superstar effect. Certain products get a lot of attention uh, uh, by uh, users and consumers thanks to the recommendations. We also have other measures that show that the recommended system strongly increase uh, market concentration, for example, uh, measured by the uh, Asian Erfindel Index, which is a typical measure of uh, product market concentration that economists uh, use. And we find no evidence of what uh, is called uh, long tail effects. That is uh, the market share of uh, niche products, if anything, is reduced by the presence of the recommended system. Um, now, I will have no time to go into the details, but uh, I think an interesting element of our approach is that since we have built this economy, we can control everything. So we can control whether this superstar effect and concentration effect that is generated by the presence of the recommender system is related to the fact that the recommender system is um, somehow biased in estimating user preferences or whether it is biased in estimating items, uh, product characteristics. Okay, so it turns out that uh, uh, most of the bias comes from a, a what we call an homogenization, sorry, homogenization of users, meaning that the estimated preference of users according to the recommender system are too similar, and hence consumers tend to buy and choose um, similar products, similar items. Okay. Now, if you want to know what is the implication of the recommender system in terms of uh, uh, users' um, actual uh, uh, payoff or utility or welfare, well, it turns out the recommender system, notwithstanding these biases and these concentration effect that was mentioned before, is uh, quite significantly increasing the surplus of the users who uh, can benefit from the recommendation from one to six percent with respect to the individual search benchmark. And this happens for two reasons. Uh, the estimations of the users and items characteristic generates a better user item match uh, through the recommender system and through the recommender system individuals are able to save on search cost. Now uh, so on one end, you see that there is a, a positive effect, which is this uh, positive impact on individual surface. On the other end, we know that there are biases. Now, as economists, we would like to understand to what extent all this is relevant in terms of market outcome, and in particular in terms of competition. So what we have done in the next step is to introduce effectively competition in the analysis. Remember that I told you that so far, 
um, sellers were completely inactive. Now we give them the possibility to react to the presence of the recommended system. And typically, the type of um, uh, adaptation that a seller would, uh, would uh, uh, think of is changing the price of the product. Okay, so think about Amazon. You are a, if you are a seller in Amazon, you realize that Amazon is using a recommended system. A recommended system is affecting the choice of individuals. Then, as a seller, you may want to change your price in order to, uh, you know, um, leverage and interact uh, in this process uh, of uh, choice, consumer choices mediated by the recommended system. So, technically, what we do for this to measure the effect of a recommended system on the intensity of competition is to study what is the implication of the presence of recommended system on the level of Nash equilibrium prices or equilibrium prices that would be optimally chosen by sellers in this market. Okay. So essentially what we do, again, comparing these two environments, individual search benchmark where individuals are on their own, they have to search for items. So sellers are, look, are anticipating some expected demand that now depends on the prices that each one of the sellers of these items uh, decides to, to set. Okay, and so we study what is the equilibrium of, in terms of prices in this environment, and we compare uh, these, uh, these prices with the prices that would emerge in an environment where instead, before start searching, users are prompted some recommendations by that is generated by the algorithm. Okay, so here is where uh, the what we call the algorithmic de demand comes uh, in, uh, because now the demand that is expressed by consumer is mediated by the presence of the recommended system. Okay, so we're going to essentially for for the con economists in the audience, we're going to study and compare the prices. Uh, that emerges as a Nash equilibrium where the demand is the standard demand generated by individual search with the prices that would emerge with the demand uh, uh, that is uh, mediated by the algorithm or the algorithmic demand. Okay. So what you see here in this heat map is the uh, uh, change in price generated by the presence of the recommended system. Okay, so uh, you see the scale is uh, all red, meaning that um, no matter what is the market size, no matter what is the characteristic of the products, whether they are differentially, sorry, vertically or horizontally differentiated, you see a quite significant increase of prices in the ballpark of uh, uh, 20 to 40 percent. So that's really the impact of the recommended system on the level of uh, prices. So in other words, the recommended systems induce sellers to increase their prices. Okay? And uh, we also, it's not reported here, but we will also check the feedback loop effect, which is likely reducing prices, but more or less we are, uh, uh, um, uh, more or less we are in this environment. Now, I remember that I told you that the recommended system increases the match, the, the quality of the match between users and items. Okay, that was in the case of, uh, uh, constant prices, but now that we account for a price increase, we want to know what is the overall impact of the recommended system uh, for our consumers, because our consumers are now paying a price that is chosen by uh, the sellers. So the overall effect now is that the price increase that is induced by the recommended system eats up essentially a large part of the uh, improved quality match that the recommended system is uh, is able to give uh, with respect to the individual search. And in fact, in some cases, you see some uh, light blue here, you also, we also observe uh, a reduction in uh, user surplus. Uh, again, in this case, generated by the recommended systems once we account for the fact that the recommended system induces sellers to increase their prices. Okay. so. Of course, you may ask, and it's a legitimate question, why recommended systems are pushing sellers to increase their prices? Okay, I think it's a very interesting question. So we have explored into the algorithmic demand and we have identified some facts uh, or some implications on the demand 
generated by the fact that demand is mediated by the recommendation system that actually are typically uh, facts or elements that generate uh, a, a, an overall increase in prices. Okay, so uh, essentially what you see in this graph here is a typical uh, change in demand uh, starting from the blue benchmark with no recommendation system, going to the red uh, demand function with the recommendation system. So this is the typical demand as economists would uh, represent it. So on the horizontal line, you would have quantity and the vertical line, you would have willingness to pay for each one of the units or prices that are charged for this one of the units. Okay. So essentially what you see here is that when you go from the benchmark without recommender system, the blue line, and you introduce the recommender system, you see that there is an upward shift uh, of the demand, which typically increases the equilibrium price that consumer will tend to uh, will have to pay. Why an upward uh, uh, an upward shift? Well, the recommender system, remember I told you, does a very good job in matching users and items. So uh, it, the recommender system is going to recommend items to users that on average tend to have higher willingness to pay rather than the willingness to pay this user may have if they randomly search on their own in the market. Okay, So this upward shift of the demand is typically increasing a factor that induces higher, higher prices. There are also other uh, modifications uh, of the algorithmic demand. I will not uh, have time to go into the details. So there are several uh, tilts of the demand that have, uh, uh, in some cases, obvious effect on pricing. Now the cases are, uh, are more ambiguous. Okay. Now, uh, let me, I'm, I'm going towards the, the end of my talk, but I just want to, to mention a couple of things that we have done, uh, and we're actually currently exploring, uh, still exploring. Now, what about uh, manipulations? Um, so, you know that in some cases, platforms may earn more money if certain transactions on certain items take place. There is a lot of discussion about the fact that Amazon, for example, as a seller in its own platform, may earn more money by directly selling to consumers rather than, sell, rather than letting other sellers to sell to the uh, users and consumers that are on the platform. So in a sense, Amazon using its own recommendation system may have an incentive to over recommend its own items. Okay, so, so that there are allegations uh, of uh, this kind of things uh, happening. So, what happens if the platform now can manipulate? So far, from what I've shown you so far, all the results were based on the assumption that the recommender system was recommending the best match calculated for any given users. Now, the platform may manipulate. Now, what happens if the platform starts manipulate, manipulating certain items, that is prompting to certain users those items with a higher frequency with respect to what you would have for the non-manipulated recommendation? So what we observe is kind of surprisingly that manipulation reduces prices up to 10%. Now here you have a trade-off effect of manipulation. On one end, of course, manipulation manipulations worsen the match value huh? because by definition, you are not uh, referring to a consumer the best possible items. But on the other end, uh, once you account for sellers' reaction, sellers will react to manipulated items by reducing the price. So in principle, the overall effect is not obvious. We calculate in our economy what is the net effect of these two effects, of, of, of these two uh, observations, and the net effect is unfortunately uh, negative. Okay, so manipulation will uh, uh, decrease consumer surplus, uh, user surplus. How bad is this? So will platform have a tendency to continue uh, manipulate more and more uh, these items uh, that they prefer? Well, we show that it's not necessarily the case, precisely because of the reaction on market prices. Remember that I've shown you that manipulation reduces the price of the products. Okay, And if the platform earns money through the transaction, that is through the price of the products, the more you manipulate, the lower will be the price you will be 
earning from each one of the products. So there is a maximum amount of manipulation that makes sense for the platform and is certainly quite limited with respect to what we uh, would otherwise uh, think of. Um, now, uh, the last thing I want to mention is that we do a lot of uh, uh, robustness analysis, uh, changing uh, the, some characteristic of the algorithm, changing the nature of uh, the ratings, we use uh, Likert scales with different scales, uh, we change the properties, the density, for example, of the uh, rating matrix. Uh, we do several uh, different analysis in terms of cross-validation of the algorithm. All the results that I've shown you are robust. And the last uh, uh, information I want to show you is what happens, what is uh, the relationship that we found between the quality of information that you give to the recommender system and the equilibrium prices and the quality and the, the average consumer surplus. On the first graph that you see here are different experiments by tweaking our environment in one way or another, giving more or less quality of information to the recommender system. And you see that the more information you give to the recommender system, the higher the price the higher the, the equilibrium price, which means that if you look at the impact of the recommended system and the quality of information that it has on the consumer surplus, you will gonna have a uh, inverted U-shaped relationship. Of course, higher information will uh, generate better match value between the algorithms and the consumers, but at the same time, consumers are gonna pay higher price, prices. It's the first uh, graph that you see here, okay? So there is a trade-off. Meaning that there is a potential here uh, result, uh, uh, sorry, a, a result that is potentially speaking about uh, uh, the level of privacy that we want to give uh, uh, to consumers in this market once you account for the presence of recommender system. Okay, we have a bunch of other uh, related projects that extend the market environment, the algorithms, uh, but uh, I have no time to go on. So last word on policy implications. What are the policy implications of all this? Probably it's too early to, to, to you know, come up with uh, uh, neat policy implications. Um, certainly, uh, recommender systems are improving match value and uh, reducing the search cost of individuals. They tend to grant overall uh, increasing user surplus. But if you account of um, the effect of price increases, then the net effect may be negative. Hence, we think monitoring at least uh, of the impact of recommended system is important. Um, and, uh, and probably what was thought a real concern that is feedback loop and manipulation, at least in our analysis, don't show up as a first order issues. But uh, as I said, more, more research is certainly needed on that. Thanks a lot for your attention and we'll be more than happy to um, uh, answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Giacomo. Uh, I enjoyed this talk a lot, maybe because it's a bit outside of my uh, research area. Um, of course, uh, everybody who's got intrigued and has further questions for Giacomo can either raise a hand, and I hope I will see it, or type something in the chat, uh, and uh, you will be able to join this discussion. We have another 10 minutes. Um, your results are pretty much surprising to me. So when you said that the long tail doesn't sh really show, I was pretty much shocked. Um, it, how much of a surprise was it to you? No, I know, you are right, Petra. So uh, I know that there, is, there has been a, a quite a bit of discussion on, on, on this, but uh, uh, what we have done here is really trying to take the typical economic environment that economists would use to generate a market economy. Uh, so as you've seen, we, have, we really started from scratch, from users' preferences to uh, product characteristics, and we, and, and we, and we build uh, uh, the economy in, this, in these terms. We vary product accounting for horizontal differentiation, uh, vertical differentiation, we give in the, in the market, in the economy, some uh, centrality positions, some products that are by construction closer to, uh, to 
to most of the consumers, and then you could expect those being um, uh, being um, uh, most relevant to most of consumers. And also, we allow for niche products. Now, what we have done, the next step, and I think to some extent, this is a missing step in some of the, uh, at least the literature that we are aware of. What we have done is comparing two worlds. One where there are, uh, uh, there is no recommender system and hence individual must search individually. And one world in which there is a recommender system and hence individuals can rely also on the recommender system. It's by means of this comparison that we can say that we don't see a niche or long tail effect. So what I think is a, uh, you know, contribution of our economist approach is really starting from scratch of the uh, market economy, where in the uh, benchmark environment, users are free to search autonomously and independently. And this is something that, at least to my, underst uh, my understanding, is that hasn't been uh, really explored uh, uh, thoroughly in the literature, at least that I know. So one thing that I would expect of such an experiment is that uh, the total amount of purchases increases. So that, um, I'm not sure if this was part of your simulation. So that people would buy things that they didn't even know that they needed. So that the whole economy would get bigger. It's correct. This is what we have in the data. Yes, uh, when I was mentioning that the match value increases, it's a, an implication is not only that uh, the average you pay off or utility that users get is higher thanks to the recommended system. Uh, I also mean that the number of transactions that take place in the economy is higher. Yes, you're absolutely right. Okay, so I'm reading here uh, some comments. Um, so somebody is asking about more details on the recommender system. This is Jin Feng. Um, and the, so can you like... Um... Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I kind of skipped it uh, because in a sense what we've done here is uh, relying on computer science. So as was mentioning, we're gonna we use the model-based collaborative filtering uh, where uh, essentially the algorithms works in these uh, four steps that you see here. The first step assumes a parsimonious structure of uh, how the ratings are generated by users. And the parsimonious structure is again based on uh, uh, some user dimensions and some iter dimensions so a theta and a beta, very similar to the user preferences. And then the rating is expressed by users, and this is an assumption built in the model, by the vector combination of this uh, theta and beta, user and items. So the next step, once you assumed uh, the structure of uh, uh, the, how uh, the ratings are built, uh, the algorithm joins, jointly estimates the, this theta and beta by minimizing some uh, accuracy loss on the observed ratings, of course, uh, with some regularization. So with some parameters that allow to regularize uh, uh, this estimation. Uh, and then the last step, once you have uh, computed the entire vector of theta and beta estimated, then you are able to reconstruct the ratings of any items and any individual, all also those who were never observed in the real world. Okay, once you have this, then you can rank and make the recommendations accordingly. That's the uh, model that we use uh, in the recommender system. Um, I hope that this satisfied uh, satisfies the curiosity. Uh -huh. So Jean Feng is uh, thanking you. Um, so uh, Mohammed is asking about, do you have a GitHub uh, repository for uh, the this implementation of the simulation? Sure, uh, not on GitHub, not uh, yet. Uh, you, you may know that the economists are not uh, frequently using GitHub. We, we use other uh, repositories, uh, but uh, of course, uh, I'll send you, if you write me, if you drop me an email, I'll send you the link uh, of all this. 
And some people might be uh, interested in getting the slides of this presentation as well. So are as you well, sure. Okay. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, so, more than happy. Uh, so uh, email, okay. So maybe it's better if they write you an email directly or? Yeah, that's, or yeah. just check my webpage. Everything is, it's. Uh, okay, so Giacomo will make it available on the webpage. Check the webpage first and then, <laughs> only if you don't find the information right here. Right, right. Uh, somebody, can you share your webpage in the chat, Giacomo? Can you? Um... Of course, yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, this requires a little bit of work. Uh, yeah. So I can stop sharing, I guess, right? Uh, yes, yeah. I guess yeah. uh, you can. Very good. I won't challenge your multitasking skills. No, no, no <laughs> worries. No worries. Let's try. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, I'm happy to to try and, uh, and multitask and answer questions, but I'm almost done. I was also surprised about this individual search benchmark. Well, well, there was like a red graph somewhere that was practically horizontal as compared to something very steep in the recommender system graphs. So what exactly is this, the idea behind this individual search benchmark? Yes. Okay. That's a, that's a very important point. As I said, it's a, a key element in our analysis. Uh, uh, so, the individual search benchmark is, as I said uh, before, it's a it's a world. If you want, at this point, an hypothetic world where there is no recommender system. Now, you are a consumer in this environment. You know that there is a notion of products. You don't know whether how much you like each one of these products. So how would you do before the existence of the recommender system? We use this benchmark because by contrasting what we observe with and without the recommender system, we can attribute to the recommender system uh, its own precise effect. Now, the individual search benchmark is an environment, as I said, with no recommender system. It's a typical model that economists would use to study market with incomplete information. So there is a, I would say, 50 years of uh, literature and some Nobel Prizes on uh, this type of environment. So we essentially, we didn't invent anything there. We just borrowed on what is uh, so far at this point uh, completely standard. Um, and essentially, it's, a, it's an environment where, where we can model what would be the final outcome of this environment where each one of the individual will start searching. So you pick up an item, you don't know the item, you discover whether you like and how much you like, and you continue to search if you uh, are uh, unhappy with what you have uh, discovered so far. Oh, so this search is not like a Google search. It's uh, just random uh, kind of putting your hand in a black uh, box that and getting something out. Right, that's, that's, a, that's a very good point. So if you, if you want, even before internet, that was the metaphor, right? So you walk into a shop and you discover whether you like that item that that shop is selling. Nowadays, you have uh, uh, search engines. Now, search engines are making search problems much simpler, of course, right? Uh, but they are not doing the same job as the recommender system. So we know that they are a completely different object. So, and we also know that search engines are still associated with quite significant search cost. So certainly, this ser individual search process is much simpler if you uh, can rely on a search engine rather than walking to a shop but it's still associated with some uh, uh, significant search cost. Okay, so you can embed a search engine in the metaphor, in the case of no recommendation, and you would still be able to compare what is the world with and without the recommender systems. Okay, but it's very useful to to clarify this. You're absolutely right. <laughs> this just shows my ignorance, probably on the on the topic at hand. Um, but I would still imagine that consumers are influenced by uh, advertising, by packaging, or by some kind of impulse buys. So um, this uh, baseline seems to me very, uh, how to say, um, restrictive kind of, and a bit unrealistic. 
Okay, so it, uh, it I, doesn't I, seem like a good simulation of a world with before recommender systems. Okay, so yeah. that, that's a that's a fair point. It's a good point. It's a fair one. Uh, so the point is that whenever you add any of those elements to the benchmark environment, you have to add it to the environment with the recommender system as well. So our claim is that you can enrich the two environments similarly, for example, giving the sellers the possibility to send uh, advertisements to users. But if you want to have a fair comparison, you have to do this both in the individual search environment and in the case of the recommender system. So our idea, but uh, to, uh, that's, that's true at the moment is a claim, is that whatever enrichment you do in the two environments, that would uh, net out in terms of measuring the actual impact of the recommender system. Or if you want, it could be addressed, all this could be addressed by changing a key parameters that we have in the model, which is the individual search cost. I didn't have time to mention, but in the, the way we model this uh, search process is by also by means of uh, parameterizing the individual cost to do an additional search process or an additional search activity. Okay? So our claim is that you can enrich, but you have to enrich both environments to have a fair comparison. Okay, makes sense, makes sense. Uh, well, I think that our time is up. I see that you put your web page in the chat box. So if anybody still needs to click it, just click it. I would totally enjoy go, going out for a dinner with you tonight and discuss it uh, for hours more. I got inspired by this uh, new thing that I uh, learned today. Uh, so thank you again for talking here to us today and hopefully to see you around at some other Civica event or otherwise. Thanks a lot, Petra. Thank you. And thanks to everybody for uh, listening to this talk. And uh, I, I also really enjoyed uh, discussing with all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye-bye.